Okay, well, we have a fairly relaxed schedule, but we should probably start close to time. Uh, actually, before I start, I wanted to acknowledge and thank the uh, CERN Theory Department for hosting uh, this institute. Uh, it's very kind of them to do that. So, uh, in particular, Wolfgang has been quite helpful and the rest of the members. So, uh, anyway, just wanted to say uh, that and thank them. Uh, and then regarding this talk, so actually the two talks today, uh, I'm thinking of the purpose of them uh, as partly to set up and stimulate discussion. And that's what I'm uh, planning on doing today. Uh, is I think you'll find, well, I hope I stimulate some discussion with what I'm going to say. So quantum information has been a real unifying theme in physics, particularly in recent years. It's been discussed a lot in quantum gravity, obviously, I, but I believe that it is important to raise our standards of how we think about it in gravity, that we're not uh, being careful and sophisticated enough yet in trying to understand and describe quantum information in gravity. One key question just to get started, is that of how quantum information is localized in quantum gravity. And that's really a prerequisite to asking other questions like how does it evolve, and so on. And you'll see more what I mean by that shortly. So first, localization of information. Uh, certainly in quantum field theory, that's part of the foundational axiomatic structure. You particularly see that when you consider local quantum field theory from the algebraic viewpoint, where you basically hardwire into the description, uh, as we'll see momentarily, a uh, notion of localization of, uh, well, essentially of information. Localization of information is also a prelude to discussing all kinds of other things that we like to describe in physics, uh, especially these days, like entanglement, uh, complexity, uh, entropy, you know, it's a, understanding localization of information in some sense is a prelude, for example, to some of the things Raphael introduced this morning. And in particular, it seems to play a very important role in some of the deepest puzzles of <coughs> gravity. Uh, those in particular involving holography and black holes. So to say a little bit more, uh, is gravitational physics truly holographic? And of course, we have a proposal along those lines. The question is, is information that is, in a real sense, in the bulk of ADS, also, in, a, in some equivalent way, present at the boundary of ADS? And if that's really true at the full fine-grained level, how do we describe that in detail and reconcile that with the notion that the information is localized in the bulk? How does that work? Or, if we're talking about black holes, is information that is in some sense thought of as being inside a black hole also in some <coughs> dual sense or some other sense present near the horizon of a black hole, of that black hole, or is it somehow present even all the way out to infinity? And there have been things along these lines said in the context of, say, soft hair discussions uh, and so on. But if this is true, again, how do we reconcile uh, this with the locality we have in the G Newton goes to zero limit? And how do we really describe this kind of delocalization of information? <coughs> That's particularly important for one of the biggest puzzles we face in this subject, uh, that of black hole evolution. Uh, specifically, if information can be localized in a black hole, for example, black holes are subsystems of a bigger quantum system. And if black holes shrink and disappear, so that subsystem disappears, as Hawking originally told us, and if physics is unitary, then an inevitable conclusion is that information must transfer out of the black hole. I don't see any way around that. Uh, and that's something that violates the basic principles of local quantum field theory. It's not apparently possible within local quantum field theory. 
So this drives at the heart of what quantum, quantum gravity is about. And we need to understand how to describe this and what it tells us about the dynamics of quantum gravity. So I view this problem, and that's why I've worked on it a lot over the years, is really, it looks to me like a key question for quantum gravity. Yeah. Say again? Well, uh, well I'm, no, I'm, actually, I'm not assuming that at the fundamental level. No, I'm just saying that if you, just not even effective field theory, if you have a quantum system with a quantum subsystem, you don't have to have it be local quantum field theory or anything, just a quantum system with a quantum subsystem. Uh, and if that quantum subsystem has some information in it, uh, and the subsystem disappears and you want unitary evolution, the information had better come out. That's just a basic statement about quantum mechanics. Now, you might say I have to be more careful about describing what a subsystem is, et cetera, et cetera, and that's what I'm going to try to start working towards doing. But I don't have to use local quantum field theory to make that set of statements. Yeah, yeah, that's what I said. If information can be localized inside a black hole. Inside, but it's like, if it's sort of on the surface, then you don't have to, then local well, quantum field theory doesn't have to. No, that's not true. Yeah, that's, uh, if it's localized on the surface, the question is, can that be accommodated within local quantum field theory? Let's get to that. Okay. Okay, so I really view this question as, uh, well, the, Localization and evolution is uh, pretty fundamental in trying to understand how quantum gravity works. But let's try to be a little bit more sharp about things. How do we think about localization? And the way we usually do that is by describing subsystems. Uh, usually, this is sort of implicit in what we do, uh, and usually it's fairly simple it's assumed and it's barely discussed, but let's just remind ourselves how it works in more familiar contexts. So in finite quantum systems, you know, usually we'll have, say, coupled uh, quantum systems, say, with a Hilbert space, which is a tensor product of the Hilbert spaces corresponding to the subsystems. That's how we describe subsystems. So you can have one system, subsystem interacting with another subsystem. Uh, and describe information transfer between them, et cetera, et cetera. In local quantum field theory, the story gets more subtle. Let's suppose we have a manifold and some region U in that manifold. It's not really true that the Hilbert space of a local quantum field theory factorizes into a product of Hilbert spaces associated with the uh, region and its complement. Uh, although often, you know, people sort of gloss over this, but it, it really isn't true. And the reason is this uh, type 3 von Neumann property of uh, field theory, which colloquially can be described as infinite entanglement. You have infinite entanglement between the degrees of freedom in this region and in its complement. Now, of course, you can get around that with cutoffs and stuff like that, but then you break the fundamental symmetries of the theory. Uh, so for this reason, it's better to try to figure out another way to describe what we mean by subsystems. And instead, we focus on commuting subalgebras of observables, say associated with open regions. Uh, associated with this region is a subalgebra of the observables, say, uh, if you're talking about scalar fields, fields smeared against uh, compact support functions in this region. And if we have two space-like separated regions, U and U prime, then the algebras associated with the two regions commute. And that's how locality is hardwired into local quantum field theory. Again, this is how it's fundamentally, uh, well, the fundamental beginning of how you describe locality, say, in the algebraic approach. So here, really, it's the subalgebras that are defining the subsystems. And so we see that there's a key role for observables uh, in how to think about localization of information. And then you can go on from there to talk about, say, evolution, which describes information transfer between subsystems, and so on and so forth. <laughs>
So that's local quantum field theory, but what about when we consider gravity? And here I'm just going to study it in the perturbative approximation for now. Uh, but let's try to learn something there. So let's imagine coupling our scalar field to uh, gravity in the minimal way. Here, kappa is the square root of Newton's constant up to numerical factors. And then phi no longer is an, a physical observable because it's not gauge invariant once you're talking about gravity. Uh, under diffeomorphisms, it transforms in a non-trivial way. And so if we want to describe real physical things, a prerequisite of, for that is writing down gauge invariant objects. And uh, there are sort of roughly two approaches to that. That's convention, but it's a nice convention. It depends on yeah where you want to put kappas, say in your expansion about the flat metric, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so but psi is not just a usual vector field; it's got some uh, one over length. Uh, let me see. We could figure out the powers of length, but anyway, it's just, if you like it without the kappa there, then you define Ted's okay. psi as kappa okay. times my psi, okay. <laughs> and everything is still true. <clears throat> okay, so there are two approaches to uh, discussing observables, at least. One is, uh, and we're going to have you know, more discussion on the question of observables on Friday. Uh, the first approach are so-called relational observables, where roughly speaking, you look at an observable uh, that you'd like to localize at a point, but we just said you can't do that, but, but you effectively do that by saying, well, I'm going to use the evolution of some other field. You can think of that as a clock or some generalization of a clock. Uh, and uh, basically, you read off where your clock registers a particular value, and that localizes a point, so to speak. Uh, this is one approach to the problem of time. And in fact, it's used in inflation when you discuss, discuss inflationary perturbations uh, say, at the reheating time. That's when the scalar field, the inflaton, reaches a certain value. So that's one approach, and we'd like to better understand these things. Uh, there's another approach, which I'll focus on more, which is taking observables like, or, well, uh, that would be observables uh, in the original theory with Newton's constant turned off, and dressing them. And these come latter, uh, the latter things come closer to an algebraic structure like we were originally describing uh, in the context of just field theory. So I'm going to focus more on those for the purposes of this talk. OK, dressed observable. So given the scalar field we just talked about, can we promote it to a gauge invariant observable? And to motivate how we do this, let's think about the case of QED if we were talking about a charged scalar. Then that's not a gauge invariant. But we can dress it, multiply it by a function that is actually a functional of the field uh, to make a gauge invariant. And probably the simplest way to do this is by what's known as a Faraday line, discussed all the way back in 55, at least by Dirac. We take the uh, vector potential and basically integrate it, say, along a line out to infinity. And you can easily see that that now gives a nice gauge invariant object. So that's a candidate observable. What about gravity? Well, again, we're going to work perturbatively. Let's think about working uh, in an expansion about flat space. Again, that's the transformation law of our scalar field. And the metric perturbation h transforms like this. Now you see one of the reasons why I put the cap is where I did. <coughs> and uh, what we'd like to do is something like this procedure in QED, at least a leading order in an expansion in kappa. You can think about higher orders, but let's just try to understand the structure at leading order in kappa. So we'd like to construct what's called a dressing, which is a functional of the metric perturbation and a function dependent on the point x we're talking about. And the key property is that functional transforms under these diffs, which act on metric perturbations like that, transforms basically basically by uh, shifting by the diff parameter. That's the key property. And you can easily see that if you have such a functional, then this new quantity, phi of the original phi of x plus v, is diff invariant, again, to leading order in kappa. And that's all we're going to worry about at this point. <clears throat> 
So this transformation cancels uh, the uh, shift in phi. Okay, so again, I've reproduced those equations. What are good functionals that do this? Well, there are many possible choices, and roughly speaking, they're in correspondence with the allowed gravitational fields of a phi particle. One useful choice is to take a curve from x to infinity, like in the QED case, and basically form this kind of double integral along that curve. And it just takes a little bit of uh, effort to show that this uh, expression has this correct transformation law under the diffeomorphisms acting on H. So this we call a gravitational line and was studied in some uh, work uh, going back a few years. And basically, uh, well, one way of thinking of motivating this expression is we can localize the point X by starting at infinity and shooting a geodesic in. And sort of a diff invariant way of specifying where the point is is to ask, well, um, what direction do we have to send the geodesic and how far does it have to go if it's going to hit point X? So that's sort of a diff invariant way of specifying where X is and leads to this kind of expression with some effort. Yeah, for now. Uh, the other ones I don't really think of as gauge transformations. Okay, so this operator now with this V creates a particle plus its gravitational field. Uh, and again, you know, this is a diff invariant expression at this order. There are other gravitational fields you could construct. For example, you can take this construction and average it over all angles, and that gives you what we call the Coulomb dressing. It basically creates the particle plus the linearized Schwarzschild field from the spherical average of the uh, line. Okay. Yep. When I look at that expression, what is H? Is it a Again, H is the metric perturbation. So. Yeah, but is it a quantum operator? It yes. So that's, yep. that phi up there is a functional of my quantum operator. Well, a function. Of, or, sorry, yeah, functional. Yeah, that's correct. But again, the leading order in kappa, okay. it's basically, you know, phi plus v mu times d mu phi. And v is, you know, this nice linear thing in H. So, you know, we can handle things at that order. Again, it does get more complicated at higher orders for sure. Okay, so both of these expressions, uh, I'm not writing that one down, uh, satisfy this basic key relation, uh, and so give diff invariant observables at leading order in kappa. And another way of stating this is uh, the things we've constructed with phi of x plus v commute with the constraints, which you can think of as generating the diffeomorphisms. Again, to leading order. So true for both of those. Now you might ask, what's the relationship between those two different ways of dressing? And the answer to that is, well, this creates a gravitational field that is basically concentrated in a line, and this creates a gravitational field that is essentially linearized Schwarzschild. So if you create this one and wait, what will happen is this one will settle down to that one plus radiation going off to infinity because the gravitational field lines don't like to be confined into a little tube like that. And that's the general difference between all these different dressings you can write down is you can take a given dressing and sup basically superpose uh, a gravitational field that's purely radiative, sourceless on top of it. So the Coulomb one is a little more natural. Uh, and let's study that. And one apparent consequence we find immediately is that these diff invariant observables no longer satisfy a local algebra. They don't commute at space-like separations, basically because the dressings run into one another because uh, they're extending out, you know, away from the point in all directions. And so already at this leading order, we're seeing a kind of intrinsic gravitational non-locality just the leading order in perturbative gravity. It's built in when you think about diff invariant things. Yes? Uh, well, you could, let me just briefly answer that. We could get more into discussion of that. You could say, uh, okay, I'm going to take a point here and run the line that way, and a point here and run the line that way, so I'm good, okay? 
And you are at leading order, uh, although that's a less natural dressing, as I just explained. But you are at leading order. But the problem is, is if you're after the algebra of observables, uh, you should be able to uh, have something that creates one particle plus a line going off to infinity, or two particles plus you know twice the line, so to speak, going off to infinity, or three particles, or you know, etc. And the problem is, ultimately, you do need to think about the higher order and kappa corrections. And uh, basically, that line solution at higher order and kappa is not going to be a good uh, configuration, a good solution. When you take into account the higher order and kappa corrections, that line's going to thicken. And uh, you know, as you know, basically, if you're trying to create a particle at a given point, and it's a very, very, very massive particle, ultimately you're going to be creating a gravitational field that's strong and extends out in, roughly speaking, in all directions. You can try to ultimately focus the lines going off in one particular direction. So you're creating something like a black hole at the end of this line that gets bigger and bigger and bigger with higher and higher powers. So sooner or later, the one over here is not going to commute with the one over here. At high enough powers, you'll still have a failure of commutativity. Not that I know of. And that's interesting. OK, so we already see some intrinsic gravitational non-locality at this level. You might ask, well, you know, what's a measure of that? So you can compute these commutators uh, in the limit where you're talking about just operators creating particles, say, with mass m in the non-relativistic limit. And you get a commutator that, say, looks something like this, as we showed. So basically, the size of the commutator is related to the gravitational potential of, say, one of these particles. So you see that gets big. Uh, basically, if you can think of you know, this particle as being very massive and creating something like a black hole and this particle being near the horizon. <clears throat> and that's in accord with a general statement uh, made much, much earlier, which we called the locality bound, about you know, what are the limits to local commutators or locality in quantum field theory. I view this as likely uh, fundamentally important in the ultimate description of gravity, but it does raise a problem, and that is how can quantum information be localized? Since we can't rely on the algebra, on having a local algebra. So let's talk a little bit about how we might think of localization of information, and here we meet the story of soft charges also. So suppose we have operators creating some particles in a region, and say we dress them with gravitational lines. Uh, does the fact that we dress imply that information is not localized? Certainly in this configuration, we can detect something about that matter distribution asymptotically because we can measure you know, what the lines are doing out near infinity and tell that you know, there's some vertical separation, et cetera. So, can we detect charge or energy distributions asymptotically uh, by measuring their dressing? And so a concrete example of how you might try to do that is by looking at the soft charges of these configurations. The soft charge in electromagnetism is basically the integral of the radial component of the electric field, rescaled as you go to infinity, times an arbitrary angle dependent function. And there are similar expressions for the soft charges of gravity in terms of the metric perturbation. Uh, and in fact, uh, you know, these dressings have non-trivial soft charges. Let's just talk about electromagnetism first. So again, the Faraday line was that simple integral. That's kind of singular because it's just concentrated on a line, but you can regulate by basically smearing it over a small cone which gives you an expression that instead looks like this, an integral of the vector potential against what it is essentially a classical electrical field, which is purely radial and just concentrated in a small cone if that's where you concentrate theta. So that's an alternate dressing, which is a regulated version of the line. And if you take the dressed operator you get with that dressing and say commute it with the soft charge, uh, you get that the, you know, basically the charge of that operator is given by the integral uh, 
that we were talking about in defining the soft charge where you put in this classical electric field into the expression. So basically here it would be f of theta replaces the, this limit. Uh, <clears throat> and so that gives you the soft charge of the, that this operator carries. By the way, a note for experts in the subject that uh, you certainly have configurations without antipodal matching uh, that are created in this more general description. We can talk about that if you think that's interesting or important, but let's save it. Okay, so that's electromagnetism. Uh, back to gravity, our... Is that What's that? Is it what? Uh, no, well, um, Lorentz transformations act non-trivially on it. They boost it, yeah. But that's okay. We're talking about some particular configuration. Uh, okay, so gravity, uh, we have uh, our expression we talked about. You can commute the commutator of the dressed observables uh, with the soft charges, and you get expressions that look like this. Basically, the commutator acts on V. And these uh, also uh, commutators will depend on the profile of the dressing, like in electromagnetism. I did say the dressing is highly non-unique, and that non-uniqueness basically corresponds to adding an arbitrary radiation or sourceless field. Okay, so the soft charges and other asymptotic observables depend on the details of the radiation field that we have added, in other words. Uh, and so we can ask, is there any necessary dependence on the charge and en energy distribution? If we have some charge or energy distribution in a region, uh, is the field outside necessarily correlated in any particular way? Or can we just add a radiation field that's arbitrary to change that correlation? Well, first QED, because that's the easy one. Uh, you can show that there's very little necessary correlation because you could always run your... Faraday lines to a common point and run, the net, run them out to infinity. And then the only thing you detect out here is that there's a line with total charge Q. So you're only allowed to detect the, the total charge Q of that distribution, and that's it. You can always arrange things that way. Well, what about gravity? Can you do something similar? And the answer is yes. Uh, takes a few more slides, not too many. Uh, again, working to order kappa. So first, let's say how we dress an arbitrary operator. Instead of the field operator, we can dress a general operator, you know, generalizing this expression. General operator A has a dressed version to leading order in kappa, which is got by conjugating with the exponential of the integral of the dressing against the stress tensor. Looks like that. And so this is, again, something that you can show commutes with the constraints. Uh, likewise, we can dress a state uh, in a similar fashion by the exponential of the dressing times the stress tensor. So now trying to figure out how to uh, sort of make the details of the distribution outside uh, invisible to, or sorry, details of the inside distribution invisible to outside measurements, uh, we need to construct uh, a dressing like in QED and we showed how to do this in a paper on, well, last year. Uh, basically, the construction is the following. So if we're working with a neighborhood U, let's pick a point Y in U, and let V of Y uh, be any chosen, what we'll call standard dressing, that uh, basically dresses this point, namely satisfies our key relation at that point. Then we'll define a slight generalization of the line dressing we had before uh, that is an integral from x to y uh, that looks like this. And basically, if we add this dressing to that dressing, we get an expression which satisfies the key relation uh, that tells us it's dressing an operator at point x, except there's this funny extra term here. But basically, we're adding them, then we've got the funny extra term. Now, what does this operator do uh, if this is the dressing? Well, this creates uh, a standard gravitational field outside the region uh, because uh, outside, uh, the only thing you see is basically you know, V mu of Y and then also this funny derivative term. 
Okay, but what are the funny terms? Well, we'll come back to that in a second. Uh, again, I've reproduced that expression and the expression for dressing of a general operator. And let's consider uh, outside observations, say, of the soft charges for concreteness. So uh, for a local A, localized to the neighborhood, we want the commutator of the soft charge with the dressed operator. And you see uh, from this expression uh, that the commutator looks like this. Basically, the dressed, the leading term in the dressing is just the commutator of T with A integrated against V. And then when you commute the soft charge with that, you get a commutator of Q with V. So that's the form of the commutator of the soft charge with the dressed operator. And so we see uh, here that we want the commutator of the soft charge with the dressing we've constructed. But the soft charge is written in terms of operators out at infinity. So it's only going to see uh, this piece and this piece. It's not going to see the V that goes from X to Y because that's all localized inside the neighborhood. That doesn't create any excitations out at infinity. So all we see is the part associated with basically the commutator with the standard dressing. Let's define the commutator of the soft charges with the standard dressing to be you know, just these collection of basically functions. We can think of those as the soft charges of the standard dressing. Once we compute this commutator, let's think about the first term. Well, we get just this function, and then nothing else depends on x. So we have the integral of d3x of t0 mu of x commuted with a. That's going to give us the momentum operator commuted with a times the soft charges of the standard dressing. Likewise, with this funny extra term, well, we have some derivatives here, but we end up with something very recognizable. We get an integral of x minus y times t0 mu, which gives us the angular momentum generators. So we find that the soft charges of the dressed operator only depend on the operator acting within the neighborhood through the total momenta and the total angular momenta, the, in other words, the Poincaré charges. So that generalizes the story of electromagnetism, where we could only see the total electric charge. Well, here it's the charges that are natural uh, from the gravitational point of view that we can measure asymptotically. Yeah. Uh, so this, these are observables, but yeah, these, this again commutes with the constraints. Yeah, the, the dress states that you create, uh, before, they satisfy those uh, Weekly. Weekly. It's like in the usual Gupta Boiler story where uh, you've got to be a little bit more careful. You don't want the constraints to literally annihilate the state. Originally, you said, here, I have a bunch of charges with straight lines, mm. and I have, at infinity, it seems you have information about the vertical separation. Right. And now you're saying, oh, but I can do better, and I can hide a lot of the information. Are, are you saying this is sort of, no matter what I do, I will always be stuck with that information at infinity? Is that, is no. Uh, no. Okay. So, so what I'm saying is that, well, I'll come back. I'll draw a conclusion from this, which I think it answers that. But let me just take it one step further. Okay, so likewise, I can consider uh, you know a correlation function with a bunch of these, say, soft charges, and uh, between two dress states, and it's going to also just depend on the soft charges of the standard dressing, which are basically C numbers, so we can pull out, and then matrix elements of products of the momenta operators. So I get something depending on the moments of the total Poincaré charges and on the soft charges of the standard dressing. Uh, the dot, dot, dot is there, again, uh, for experts because uh, there's a question of whether the soft charges really annihilate the vacuum, et cetera, which we could discuss. Um, but that's the essential structure. A similar story is true with this kind of standard dressing for other asymptotic measurements. We didn't have to be talking about just soft charges. And by the way, just one comment on going beyond leading order and kappa. This also, it turns out, works classically, non-perturbatively, in the sense that I can uh, construct their theorems. Not I can, but these people who are more sophisticated than I am can construct uh, initial 
data for the gravitational field that basically does something like this. You have a solution of the constraints. And you can always replace it by a solution, uh, which is basically a gravi asymptotically a gravitational field in a cone or is a uh, boosted Kerr solution. And that's you know, these two references. So something like this works to all orders, at least classically as well. Okay, so to summarize and hopefully address Rob's question, uh, if not, he can re-ask it. Uh, <clears throat> measurements at spatial infinity, in particular of soft charges, don't detect the charge or energy momentum distribution in U. By the way, this came out in a paper just on what Friday, uh, a, a bunch of this discussion. Uh, such measurements do detect aspects of the radiation field that we have superposed on the distribution. We can always choose initial states so that the distribution and the radiation field are correlated in a certain way. So we could choose to run the lines all out one way. Uh, and you know, if we know we're in that state, we can you know, see properties of the uh, charge distribution. Uh, but we can also choose states where they are correlated in some other way. So there's no necessary linkage uh, between the soft charges and the uh, matter distribution, say, except through the total charges. In this sense, soft charges are decoupled from the information in the charge or energy distribution. And this suggests that information can be localized in electromagnetism or gravity, at least at, this, at a perturbative level. We can do something like making localized electromagnetic or gravitational qubits, is one way of saying it. Uh, for example, if you have states with the same center of mass wave function, but a different internal state. So this also suggests that uh, we can address the question of black holes. We don't seem to have asymptotic access to information in a region. Whether or not that matter is in a black hole, if you go beyond this leading order, uh, if you think about it in a perturbative analysis, Although you have to understand you know, how dressing works in a black hole background, et cetera, uh, that's something you know, currently being studied with a postdoc at Santa Barbara. It's, it is more complicated, but it's uh, strongly suggestive that you know, nothing about you know, putting this matter inside a black hole is going to change the asymptotic story. And from that point of view, it also suggests that soft hair is not relevant for black hole, uh, the black hole information problem. We've made statements like this. Uh, also, Raphael and Parati have made related statements. Uh, Jeffrey and collaborators have made related statements. Uh, so there are at least you know, various things that have been said. This is my version of the argument. Uh, and we'll probably see more discussion of this tomorrow. That is planned. If that's true, though, that soft charge or soft hair doesn't sort of exhibit the information outside a black hole, how can black hole information be made unitary and in particular consistent with quantum mechanics? And in my view, that's quite possibly through other effects, which I'll come to. But first, uh, there are some other things we might learn from this construction. So what, are, what is this notion of localization telling us about quantum gravity? Well, let's suppose that our aim is a quantum mechanical theory describing gravity. One way of asking how we get there is to try to figure out what properties, or how do the properties of gravity fit into the postulates of quantum mechanics? Now, what are the postulates of quantum mechanics? And here we want to be very general so we can accommodate quantum gravity. And sort of the basic things you need are a linear space of states, basically a Hilbert space, observables, and of course, we'd like unitarity in appropriate circumstances, say, where we have states which um, asymptotically look like flat space, say, in the far past and far future. Uh, so these are sort of a very basic set of principles where we've thrown away various stuff that isn't germane to gravity. Uh, and then from this point of view, we might ask, OK, if this is what we're aiming for, a quantum theory of gravity, we're going to have a Hilbert space. So what, are the, um, what additional construction do we have on top of the Hilbert space in order to describe gravity? From this viewpoint, we're not necessarily starting with space time. Uh, we're going to ask what structure we have on the Hilbert space uh, maybe approximately gives us back space time. But 
you know, maybe not exactly. Uh, and so this is what I call a quantum first approach to gravity, uh, which I've discussed somewhat in the literature. Also, Sean has been uh, exploring a closely related perspective on this. And we'll probably talk about that. Uh, so we'd like to, you know, obviously just having a Hilbert space and some, a set of observables in unitarity isn't enough. We need more structure, so we should look for further guidance. So we need some additional mathematical structure on H. Uh, part of the question is what is it? And we can discuss that further, but I'm going to say a few words about that. And also, there should be a notion of correspondence that uh, whatever this structure is and its dynamics, it should match on to local quantum field theory plus general relativity in a weak gravity correspondence limit. Okay, so what, what do I mean about additional mathematical structure? This is kind of abstract. Well, we have examples in the context of finite quantum systems and in quantum field theory. In typical quantum theories, we begin with some notion of a subsystem structure or localization. We've already briefly touched on that. Uh, either tensor product structure or local subalgebras, uh, if we're talking about local quantum field theory. This is how you implement what is sometimes called Einstein separability, the notion of you know, sort of separating, uh, so to speak, degrees of freedom in different regions. So, <clears throat> That's something you really start with, as I've emphasized before, uh, say in more familiar contexts. But in gravity, there's no obvious local subalgebras. Uh, and so you might ask, well, what do we do? But part of the point is, uh, we've, in what I've shown you about how information is localized, uh, we've given a slightly different way of specifying something like this. And in order to motivate that, let me first explain to you briefly an alternative approach to localizing information in quantum field theory. I said if we have a region and its complement, then the Hilbert space doesn't factorize. But there's something close to it. You can construct what's known as the split vacuum. You can read about this in Hogg if you're not familiar with this. By taking your region and extending it out an amount epsilon, and then you can show, or these folks uh, can people who invented this, I won't give the references here, showed that you can always construct a vacuum called the split vacuum, such that if you have an operator in U and an operator in the complement of U epsilon, A and A prime, and you look at the product of those and take the um, well, vacuum expectation value in the split vacuum, uh, then Basically, that completely decorrelates the operators. You get the product of the expectation values in the ordinary vacuum. So in this sense, the split vacuum disentangles the degrees of freedom inside the neighborhood and inside this complement of the bigger neighborhood. Put differently, I can act with one operator or another operator on the split vacuum, and measurements outside can't distinguish those two states. These two states are indistinguishable because of this property, and in this sense, I can think of these as basically localized qubits. The structure is not that the Hilbert space is a product of Hilbert spaces, uh, but you have an embedding of a product of Hilbert spaces associated with the region and the complement of the bigger region into the full Hilbert space. Yes. Okay. You, yeah, you need the safety margin. And yeah. This is kind of like fixed per theory. You cannot go closer. Um, oh, the, yeah, there are limitations on that. I think this is related to nuclearity or something yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah, um, but it's, it's actually a bound on that number. So right. Kind of yeah, so that, that could be interesting. Yeah, uh, although you can always take it to be bigger than that, too. So th there are limitations, though. Yeah. So. It, it Right, yeah, oh, is that good point. It's like a Hagedorn kind of problem, I think. It's the nuclearity it's business. Like the number of degrees of freedom grows uh, when you go to higher energies? Yeah, exponentially. Yeah, yeah. 
and that's, but yeah, so Hagedorn. <laughs> it's Hagedorn like behavior. Yeah. Yes? So the theory was that the formal explainer that you need that was obvious. Uh, probably not, yeah. Well, yeah, to find things with, yeah, with Hagedorn-like behavior, I think. You, you do have this problem if you think of the collection of fields of string theory as quantum fields, presumably. But anyway, and the string scale is probably relevant. But anyway, this is, this is an interesting discussion, but I think we should postpone it. So, yes. So about this split vacuum, so yep. in, in, like in the context of lattice gauge theories, yep. when you have um, non-separating Hilbert space, and when, when you divide it into like two regions, like yep. people normally supplement the Hilbert space with like some, some extra states. Well, yeah, you can have sort of link degrees of freedom between the, and yeah. And they, arbi uh, they artificially separate the Hilbert space using the space. Well, okay, so there are two different issues. We could put scalar field theory on a lattice, and then it's locally a finite system, and so locally it has a factorization, and you know basically we put in a cutoff, and so we're avoiding all this split need for the split vacuum. But then there's the question of gauge degrees, or you know gauge, or flux lines crossing the boundary. That's a different question, and that's the question which we're or I'm addressing uh, from a slightly different viewpoint when I'm writing down gauge invariant observables. In fact, so. But again, that's probably something we should discuss further later. Okay, so that's the corresponding mathematical structure that basically uh, corresponds to the split vacuum without dotting all the I's and crossing all the T's from the algebraic quantum field theory viewpoint, but close, I think. So the point is, though, in gravity or gauge theory, we've done something like this uh, with the construction we have if we think of these operators as acting on the split vacuum. Uh, basically, we're saying we have some operators that act within the neighborhood, and we don't have access to observations of you know, details of that structure you know, out here, except we can measure the charge. And so we now have what looks like an embedding of product of Hilbert spaces into the bigger Hilbert space, uh, but we've got you know, those Hilbert spaces indexed by the charge. We can measure the total charge out here, uh, whatever it is, uh, and so we need basically an index on these Hilbert spaces labeling that, uh, and it's really this full structure uh, that is expressing the states that you can have in that neighborhood. Uh, so we call this an elect electromagnetic splitting. It's most simply explained uh, what we're doing there. In gravity, though, you expect to have something like that, again, with the same construction I described, uh, where you know, you're talking about the charges. Well, they're the charges corresponding to the Poincaré algebra. All the Poincaré generators don't commute, so you might try to diagonalize a maximal set of those uh, and label the Hilbert spaces by those values uh, and also consider a similar structure. So at least that's a suggestion for where to go. There are some subtleties associated with this, uh, but uh, this basic kind of structure we refer to as a gravitational splitting. And so the mathematical structure we would be talking about now, uh, if, you know, if this is, extends, say, in something like this to the full non-perturbative theory, is a network of these kinds of uh, inclusions or embeddings of products of Hilbert spaces replacing the network of subalgebras. Okay. So that's what I that's an example of what we could mean by this mathematical structure. Uh, should, just, just this yes. So uh, this structure with the sum over Q does it have something to do with super selection sectors? Uh not exactly because we can there are operators which change Q, but um, you know the total charge within the neighborhood we can't change by acting out of the neighborhood, for example. But, uh, but, um, uh, charge transfer operators wouldn't be local, right? So it would also be well, no, well, we can take you know, this operator saying we can act with another operator that's dressed in this fashion to change Q, to bump Q up by one or whatever the fundamental charge unit is. So it's true, those are not local operators because you know, if you act with you know, another charge operator here that where you run its Faraday line like this and then out to infinity, 
you know, it's a, you're acting with something non-local to. Okay. So, so there's a similar thing. I just wish to talk about the Good. That's what discussions are for. <laughs> so great. Um, okay. There are also some very interesting strong field subtleties, particularly in gravity. You know, if you try to put too much energy in a region, the gravitational field, uh, the strong gravitational field gets bigger and bigger and ultimately consumes the region, et cetera. You know, the, this notion you do something like make a large black hole. So there are various interesting subtleties that are, should play a role in this structure. So we're not there yet, but this is suggestive. Yeah. Outside it, yeah. kind of a margin of error around that thing. Is there like a natural extension to like multi-partite splittings, or is that part probably, of the but to be discussed. Okay. Yeah, and I don't want to go too far over. I see I'm going to go a little bit over. And I'll apologize for that up front, but yeah, let me keep going. <coughs> okay, a brief comment, and that is this appears connected to. Uh, the question of holography and also raises some puzzles and we'll have some discussion about holography. So how does holography work? And in my mind, the best argument on the market goes back to original uh, work by Merolf and also elaborated on by Ted, developed by Ted, uh, that holography doesn't come from some intrinsic property of string theory, but comes from basically by virtue of the quantum version of the gravitational constraints. A quick version of Merolf's argument is you have an operator in the bulk and you can evolve it up to the boundary and sort of register it there in terms of a boundary operator, but then you can take that boundary operator and evolve it backwards purely on the boundary because the Hamiltonian is a purely boundary operator. Now that's true when we solve the constraints, in fact, that the full Hamiltonian can be thought of as a, as a surface term. But that's sort of the really quick version of Merolf's argument. Uh, <clears throat> I've said solving the constraints is the same thing as finding the gravitational dressing. And so we've explored this also in the context of ADS with a uh, Santa Barbara student. And you can do things like dress an operator with a line going out to infinity in ADS and so on and so forth. But very briefly, the puzzle, uh, <clears throat> for, or at least question for holography, so how do you construct this holographic map? You have to evolve up and then back down. Uh, so you need a finite time translation here. Another way of thinking about it is, for that matter, the momentum generators, uh, or basically the generators of ADS isometries can be thought of as translating operators from a point here you know, further out towards the boundary. And we can take a limit where you translate infinitely far. And those are also are pure boundary operators if you solve the constraints. So you might try to construct the holographic map that way. But either way, you need a finite translation. And to really implement this, you apparently need to solve the gravitational constraints, not just to leading order in kappa, but to all orders. And that is equivalent to finding the unitary bulk evolution. Okay, it's basically solving uh, you know, that set of Einstein's equations to all orders. And so that argues that we need to determine unitary bulk evolution in order to construct the holographic map from this viewpoint. We don't get unitary bulk evolution for free. Uh, and you might say, well, what about things like entanglement wedge re reconstruction? Again, possibly we could discuss this, but it looks like you need a similar input there via the all orders HRT formula, but for discussion. Okay, so unitary evolution is clearly important. What about unitary evolution? Uh, so let me just mention, uh, sort of summarizing some of what I've said so far, some reasonable postulates in my mind for quantum gravity. Uh, so one is that it respects the principles of quantum mechanics, that we have some notion of subsystem structure, which is a little subtle, but it's something like having a tensor product. It's not quite that simple. Uh, and that we also, it obeys a correspondence principle for weak gravitational fields. Uh, or at least we should try to uh, find dynamics, et cetera, that is a minimal departure from the usual story of local quantum field theory plus general relativity. Now let's consider uh, black holes in the context of these eminently reasonable postulates. And of course, we face the challenge of unitarity. But let's try to ask uh, what one can say about that. So first, if we have a basic subsystem structure, 
then uh, we expect that we can think of a black hole in its environment as subsystems of a bigger system. And so we can label the states of the black hole in its environment in a form something like this, where K index the black index is an index for the black hole states. And the state of the environment is something like uh, a state described by local quantum field theory by postulate three correspondence. You know, far outside the black hole, good old local quantum field theory should work. And of course, there are expected to be a large number of internal states, so to speak, of a black hole. So we at least have that kind of structure. Uh, but then when we look at evolution, postulate one, quantum mechanics, unitarity, tells us that you know, this evolution should be unitary. Uh, so let's think about its infinitesimal version. And in general, if you have subsystems, uh, you can have, say, Hamiltonian, a Hamiltonian term acting just on one subsystem or on the other, and then a coupling term between the two. We can, by the way, write local quantum field theory evolution in this way, but it has the wrong H, because we know in the end it gives the wrong answer. It doesn't give unitary evolution. Uh, but uh, we're looking for the right evolution, and so the evolution operator acting on the environment should be approximately the evolution of local quantum field theory, again, by correspondence. Uh, the evolution operator acting on the black hole states we'll think of as unknown and be agnostic about it. Uh, but going back to what I said earlier, the interaction term must transfer information in order to be unitary, to have unitary evolution. So we'll focus on that, and let's try to give just an effective description of it, parameterizing our ignorance. So again, here I've reproduced some of what I had. Uh, and what we want is an operator that, or well, a term in the Hamiltonian that transfers information from the black hole states to the environment states. And the simplest way to do that is to write down, say, a product of uh, you know, some non-trivial operator on these states. They're finitely many, so let's just think of a basis of matrices that take you from one state to another. Uh, and then, uh, in general, we can have that multiplied by an operator that acts on the environment. And so any interaction term like this is capable of transferring information from the black hole states to the environment. And we're parameterizing our ignorance, so at this stage, let's just sum over all possible such things with some coefficients, and you know, we integrate over location of the operators you know, outside the black hole, and so on. Again, just with some coefficients parameterizing our ignorance. Now I'm going to make one further postulate and that is a postulate of universality, that the new effects that go beyond local quantum field theory couple universally to matter and gauge fields. There are various motivations for this. One is the sort of universal nature of gravity. One comes from black hole mining Gedanken experiments, which we don't have time to describe now, but we can talk about. Another is from the need to, or the desire to have approximately the usual story of black hole thermodynamics. And so instead of looking at a general coupling between the black hole states and some any old operator, uh, let's focus on a coupling between the black hole states and the stress tensor, which is nice and universal. And so if the structure looks like that, then the thing that multiplies the stress tensor is behaving like a metric perturbation. It's effectively a state-dependent, because you know lambda is an operator acting on black hole states, state-dependent metric perturbation. And so we'll focus on that kind of interaction, but there are also some further constraints. First, going back to correspondence, this operator valued function should be, well, first of all, localized near the black hole. We don't want uh, a perturbation of the dynamics which is transferring information from a black hole to the next galaxy. Uh, and secondly, uh, it should be basically long wavelength should have characteristic wavelength scales, say, comparable to the size of the black hole, and also connect states with small energy differences, say, of order 1 over r, to avoid firewall-like behavior, to avoid having you know, sort of hard excitations being created near the black hole. That's one good reason, but my reason, yeah. 
Yeah, so, okay, so you stated one good reason to avoid it. You could parameterize, like I said, I'm parameterizing our ignorance. Uh, I'm, just, I'm just saying that from the point of view of the minimally violating principles and no mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, we could debate who's giving up more or less, but this is a principled viewpoint because I'm invoking a principle, and that's the notion of correspondence. And firewalls are a really bad violation of correspondence with local quantum field theory because observers of local quantum field theory plus GR, they're um, a huge departure from the usual story. Yes, but I'm going to try to do it in the least damaging way possible. That's. Well, we can, again, that's, this is a good thing for either later discussion or tomorrow's discussion. We can discuss this. It's good to discuss. But, but, you know, a firewall, and this is one of the reasons why it's bothered people, is a huge departure from the local quantum field theory description, you know, invoked by Hawking and zillions of other people since then about how black holes work. Well... Yes, but I'm going to try to make that non-locality as innocuous as possible. That's the, okay? And we can debate what's innocuous and what isn't, but that's what I'm trying to do, okay? What's that? Anyway, let me go on. Okay, so we'll continue on that, but this term also has a job to do, and that is to maintain unitarity, and so Initially, without this term, you have a von Neumann entropy, uh, say, of the Hawking radiation, which goes up and up and up. But by the midpoint of Hawking radiation, we want the uh, von Neumann entropy to be going down. And <clears throat> so we need uh, an order one departure from the, you know, basically prediction of Hawking radiation. And specifically, there's a measure for how big this departure should be. This kind of term should be transferring of order one qubit per light crossing time out of the black hole subsystem. That's what it needs to do. Uh, so what's a sufficient condition for that? Well, sort of by dimensional analysis, if the typical expectation value of the perturbation in a typical state is of order one and all the scales are R, it's going to be transferring one bit per light crossing time. But that tells us we have order one metric perturbations. And you know that would be interesting because we're in fact in the process of looking very closely at uh, certain black holes, say the one at the center of the galaxy with the Event Horizon Telescope. And if there's an order one metric perturbation uh, near the horizon of that black hole, that's going to affect how light propagates as it goes near the horizon. And here's a little simulation of the kind of thing you might see ultimately uh, if Event Horizon Telescope data gets good enough and if this story were true. Uh, you'd see a very interesting time dependence of the image uh, from uh, Event Horizon Telescope. So that would be spectacular, but uh, let's be a little sober about this. Uh, what's a necessary condition uh, for uh, so, well, what do we need in order to s transfer sufficient information? Uh, and in fact, this is an example of an interesting general problem in quantum information theory. If we have two subsystems with a uh, coupling, say a bilinear coupling between them, uh, how does the information transfer depend on that coupling and on properties of the subsystems? So Rota will talk a little bit more about this and initiate some discussion on Wednesday. But in the present context, it turns out that a, um, uh, the necessary size of the metric perturbation is not one, uh, but the metric perturbation in a typical state can actually be of order e to the minus uh, the uh, black hole entropy over two. Uh, something of this size apparently is large enough to transfer the information out. And a very rough argument for that is via Fermi's golden rule. Roughly, you can think of uh, this in analogy with decay of, say, an atom. Uh, 
Uh, and if you look at the probability for an atom to decay per unit time, well, you might think that each time there's a decay, there's something like one, one bit of information transferred. So that's the sort of parallel we're using. And the uh, decay rate is, by Fermi's golden rule, 2 pi times the density of final states times the matrix element squared of the interaction. Again, the interaction looks like this, so it's got sort of the matrix element. Uh, we have the matrix element of H squared, roughly. Uh, so that can be exponentially small, and we can still get an order one rate because there's a huge density of final states uh, corresponding to all the possible final states of the black hole. So you can have a cancellation between something exponentially small and something exponentially big and get the right information transfer rate. Okay, so uh, if, this is, if that's the correct story, the effects are in that sense quite weak, uh, <clears throat> but still there are two lessons. One is that black holes are intrinsically quantum objects at horizon scales. Uh, and a second interesting thing is there's a similar argument, which I could give later, that you can have order one modification to scattering amplitudes of uh, long wavelength modes from a black hole. And we do actually study long wavelength modes when we study gravitational radiation from coalescing black holes. So there's the possibility uh, still to be studied of, even in this weak scenario, that there could be signatures in gravitational radiation. But if this is true, you know, the big important question is, what is this really telling us about the underlying dynamics of quantum gravity? And that, you know, here I, I want to think of unitarity as a guide, but uh, there are still some pretty deep puzzles here about, you know, what's the fundamental structure of a theory that could produce this kind of interaction. Okay, well, I should stop there. I'm a little over time. Uh, so I'll just summarize uh, and conclude. So when we better understand information uh, in quantum gravity, in gravity, we will better understand quantum gravity, I predict, but uh, we really do need to raise our standards uh, as part of that process. Uh, the notion of localization and subsystems uh, or the question of localization in subsystems is a key structural question. And apparently the structure is rather different from that of local quantum field theory. As I've explained, observables are non-local. Uh, the, there is a perturbative notion of localization of information in terms of localized states, roughly what I've described. Uh, we can show a certain insensitivity of the soft charges or other asymptotic observables to information that we can think of as localized in a region in terms of these states. And uh, plausibly, you know, the full mathematical structure here is part of a foundational quantum first descrip description of gravity. Uh, that's something very interesting to pursue. Uh, on the subject of holography, well, the basic point of holography is suggesting that there's a non-perturbative delocalization of information. But at least from the perspective I've argued, and I think we should discuss this, um, but from what I've said, this kind of delocalization or the notion of how holography works appears to rely on having unitary non-perturbative bulk evolution. Uh, finally, unitary evolution obviously is key. Uh, in black holes, it's apparently possible by what are, uh, in the sense I've described, exponentially small corrections, but corrections which could possibly have observable effects. Uh, these do represent a departure from the locality of local quantum field theory. I don't think we can avoid that, whether we're talking about firewalls or something else. Uh, and I think this is a story that's much nicer than the firewall story. <clears throat> but of course, you know, the underlying question, as I've already mentioned, is uh, you know, what is the more fundamental description of a theory, you know, say based on some structure here, which has this kind of dynamics and matches on to local quantum field theory. So I'll stop there and uh, thanks uh, for your attention. I expect some of this may be controversial, so I look forward to discussing it. I guess in the spirit of things, yeah, we could have a few brief questions and then uh, we should break for coffee and then we can come back for discussion of various things, including this. Sean. Sure.
As far as I could tell, you were not distinguishing the electromagnetic case from the gravitational case. Uh, I think I've heard you dis distinguish them before, but you say here, you know, gravity, unlike local quantum field theory, has non-local observables. But I tend to think of electromagnetism as a local quantum field theory. So yep. is, is there a fundamental difference between them? Yes, two. <laughs> okay. Do I get a uh, follow-up question? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, there are two. Okay. So first of all, um, QED has local observables, and gravity doesn't. Okay. So there is a notion of localization in QED, but there's something also. It, they're they're both related to the same underlying thing. In fact, um, that is gravity couples to momenta. Um, so that that tells us gravity doesn't have local observables. But it also tells us that if I try to make a state in a region um, and I make a more and more energetic state, it becomes less and less local, in fact. And in the asymptotic limit, it's completely non-local. You know, if you say, think of it algebraically, like I was describing, if you act with many powers of an operator creating the particle, you've got to have an effect that extends way out. So that's another property related to the fact that gravity couples to momentum which uh, is very different from the behavior of QED. So is that basically the Bekenstein bound in some sense? We can't put... It's not strictly the Bekenstein bound, but it's something with a similar flavor. Well, just a brief comment. Uh, one reason for me sitting here is that uh, uh, I do think I have important answers to almost all the questions you have. Of course, not, uh, not all of them. There are still mysteries, so don't be worried. But uh, uh, the discussions about the firewall, about uh, the way the information uh, goes, uh, mm -hmm. can be answered if you have some, make some very basic which assumptions that I find totally natural that don't need you know, to upset all we know about physics or anything like that. So uh, yeah. I hope to be able to discuss that tomorrow in my talk, but also uh, maybe in discussion. Yeah, well, uh, yeah, we look forward to that. I think one of the purposes here is to compare the different perspectives and try to get more into the details of, you know, what departures are they from the usual local quantum field theory description, and, you know, in, in what sense are some departures bigger than others, or how do we compare them, et cetera. And I think that should also be part of the discussion, so I'm looking forward to that. Okay, I guess one last question and we will break. So there is, uh, so I go back to the earlier part of the talk, there, there were four points. And one conclusion was that there was a independence between the soft dressing and uh, the radiation. And, and really to that, this, the fact that there was no on top portal map, there was no correlation between the two. So I think there is a tension between that and the soft, the Wayne based soft theorems. Um, bec bec because, um, well, to define squattering, we need a boundary condition at infinity, at yeah. special infinity. And uh, the, the fact that we have in soft theorems only one, both helicities of photons and graviton go to a single uh, linear combination, which is a soft particle. There is, there is a boundary condition needed that respects that, and that mm. the center polar map is one of these uh, boundary conditions, and then that fixes a relationship between radiation and soft factor. So I'm not yeah. sure if it's, if, if, okay. if f uh, freeing that constraint is compatible with the scattering and with the Weinberg. We, we should really discuss this because, well, at some point, although not everyone may be interested. But um, yeah, no, there's a question of, is there anything wrong with dropping the antipodal condition. And so far, and I've had some discussions also with Mark Cano and others, uh, so far it looks like we might be able to get away with that. But if there is something fundamentally wrong or something dictated by the scattering, you know, that'd be good to understand. But so far it, it looks like it's consistent. But anyway, we'll c continue this. So. Uh, okay, great. So uh, we'll, let's reconvene in, say, 20 minutes. Is that really right? I, or maybe, yeah, 10, 10 after, just a little later, and then we'll uh, have some continued discussion uh, of both these things and more broadly. So thank you.